ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to MIMA Symposium on Maritime Cooperation in the Indo-Pacific, Upholding the Rule of Law. I would first like to welcome His Excellency Ambassador Oka Hiroshi from the Embassy of Japan in Malaysia, His Excellency Dr. Justin Lee, the Australian High Commissioner to Malaysia, and Dr. Sabrin Jaffa, Director General of the Maritime Institute of Malaysia. We are delighted that Dr. Sabrin Jaffa, the Director General of the of the Maritime Institute of Malaysia could join us this afternoon. He places the highest significance on the symposium subject matter and will also be moderating the third session of the symposium. We have the privilege of having Dato Dr. Sabrin Jaffa deliver the opening remarks. Dato, the floor is yours. Thank you, Alif. Honorable moderators, His Alliance's ambassadors, speakers, and distinguished participants from Lisa and from all over the world. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and a very good morning to everyone and welcome to this momentous symposium. The Maritime Institute of Malaysia or MIMA is honored to partner with both the Embassy of Japan and the Australian High Commission in Kuala Lumpur once again to organize this event. Together, we are privileged to welcome everyone here to this symposium entitled Maritime Cooperation in the Indo-Pacific Upholding the Rules of Law. To our guests joining from all over the world in different time zones, I hope you will enjoy and benefit from the discussions at this symposium. Ladies and gentlemen, as a result of the increased vaccination rate around the globe, we are now seeing optimistic signs of pandemic regression. Infection rates are falling, restrictions are relaxed, and businesses are encouraged to restart. Throughout the crisis, MIMA has flexibly adapted to the new normal through technology to accomplish our vision and mission as a policy research institute addressing vital, vital national, regional, and global maritime affairs from Southeast Asia to the Indo-Pacific region. With support from the Japanese Embassy and the Australian High Commission, MIMA has conducted a series of events since the pandemic began in 2020, enabling the discourse on maritime affairs in the Indo-Pacific to continue, starting with the physical Indo-Pacific Conference in 2019. The Association of South Asian Nations, or ASEAN, released the ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific as a way to maintain its centrality and relevance in the Indo-Pacific discussions. But it also works to promote the rule of international law, such as the 92 United Nations Commission on Law of the Sea, or LOSC, and the ASEAN Charter, to preserve peace and stability of the maritime order, especially in the South China Sea. One crucial component of the Indo-Pacific discourse is the rules-based regional order. The rules-based regional order ensures that the rule of law, freedom of navigation and overflight, free trade, and open and secure cyberspace in the Indo-Pacific are maintained. As a critical shipping lane for global maritime trade and energy supply, the Indo-Pacific region should also maintain a region of cooperation, connectivity, and community building in compliance with international law, notably the LOSC. At the same time, this cooperation must be aligned with the ideas stated in the ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific. In recent years, we have witnessed the increasing military builds up in the contested waters, which has turned it into an arena for geopolitical, geopolitical competition between the major powers. Furthermore, the different interpretation of the LOSC among global states also complicate the matter. Therefore, this symposium aims to address the multiple challenges regional states face in upholding the LOSC in the peaceful resolution of maritime affairs 
in South Asia and the greater Indo-Pacific regions. Ladies and gentlemen, as a region consisting of imperative sea lines of communication, such as the South China Sea and the Straits of Malacca, the region has drawn interesting attention from external players. It is understandable that Southeast Asian nations face new challenges as a result of many Indo-Pacific partners overlapping interests in critical SLOCs. However, ASEAN has been consistent in promoting the region to be free and open, focus, focusing on rejuvenation following the economic downturn caused by the COVID-19 pandemics. The Indo-Pacific connects the vast Indian and Western Pacific Oceans into a single maritime space. The region accounts for over 50% of global maritime trade and about 60% of the world's GDP with Southeast Asia lying at the geographical center of the region. Therefore, the maritime domain and Southeast Asian states are indispensable in the Indo-Pacific discourse. Hence, the small ASEAN states need to participate in multilateral cooperation with the Indo-Pacific partners, particularly the middle powers like Japan, Australia, and India against the backdrop of the, of the United States and China great power competition to adhere to and maintain the ASEAN neutrality and centrality principles. Maritime cooperation in compliance with the LOC as emphasized in the ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific should be promoted with the Indo-Pacific partners, not only to tackle maritime security challenges, but also for the sustainable development, development of maritime resources, the protection of the marine environment, as well as to develop maritime connectivity. The maritime domain is a is a source of livelihood for many and contributes significantly to the economy of the coastal states. Nonetheless, overexploitation and competition for marine resources have destabilized relations between these states. Thus, today's forum provides a track to platform to discuss potential multilateral cooperative efforts between Indo-Pacific nations, ensuring a sustainable ocean economy guided by international law and regulations. The distinguished lineup of speakers from across the Indo-Pacific today will offer their views on the issues pertaining to the rule of law in the region's maritime domain, especially in the contested South China Sea. I am keen to hear proposals on how the Southeast Asian states can break through the current dilemma they face with the compliant issue uh, issues on the law of sea convention to resolve maritime territorial disputes peacefully and also the power competition of major powers in the South China Sea in order to preserve a peaceful order in this dynamic region. Apart from maritime territorial disputes, cooperation in marine resources management is also equally important to ensure harmony and stability in the maritime space of the Indo-Pacific. Finally, I wish to thank the symposium supporters, namely the, Emb the Embassy of Japan and the High Commission of Australia in Kuala Lumpur. They have contributed directly and, and indirectly towards shaping the discourse of the law-based maritime corporations in the Indo-Pacific. The Maritime State of Malaysia pledges to contribute to this effort by moving together in the spirit of cooperation on research and ideas to ensure that Malaysia as the maritime nation continues to play its role as an essential economic, environmental, and social hub serving the local, regional, and international community. With that, I thank you for your participation. I look forward to the volume and breadth of deliberation and take this opportunity to wish success for the symposium. Over to you, Moderator Alif. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Sabrin Jaffa. 
I would now like to invite all our guests and speakers today for a group photo. So may everyone please turn on the cameras and smile at the count of three. Okay, one, two, three. Okay, um, again, I just wanna thank the Embassy of Japan in Malaysia and the Australian High Commission in Kuala Lumpur for supporting our program over the next three days. We are now going to begin the first session entitled The Compliance Dilemma, Upholding UNCLOS 1982 Towards a Peaceful Indo-Pacific. To our audience members today, if you have any questions for our speakers or even our moderator, please use the Q&A feature so that our panel can address them. The Maritime Institute of Malaysia is pleased to present our first moderator, Professor Dr. Irwin Wee. Professor Dr. Irwin is a professor of maritime and transport law at the Faculty of Law, University of Technology, Mara Shah Alam. He is the head of Law School Center for Advocacy and Dispute Resolution. Professor Wee is the author of more than a dozen volumes of Palsbury Law of Malaysia in various areas of shipping, transport, and insurance law. Professor Wee is, is an actively involved with the International Malaysian Society of Maritime Law and is a chartered member of the Chartered Institute of Logistics and Transport, Selangor Section. Professor Dr. Wen Wee, you now have the floor. Um, thank you so much, um, Alev. Um, I was just wondering, am I audible to everyone here? Hi. Yes. Thank you. Um, uh, let me start off by saying, uh, it is a very good idea to actually take the photos first. Uh, when all of us still look very fresh and uh, we have not been run mentally ragged just thinking about these issues because all that thinking should be left to our um, honored academicians um, and famous professors who are here um, because uh, they get paid to do the thinking. Right, so uh, welcome. Uh, thank you for being here, everyone. Our honored guests, our VIPs, um, not forgetting um, someone who's very dear to my heart, uh, Dr. Dr. Sabirin Jaffa. Right. We go back a long way. Um, so the first session today, uh, we'll look at the uh, dilemma in how we can uphold provisions of UNCLOS 1982 uh, and at the same time try to meet you know, peaceful uh, objectives uh, in ASEAN and the uh, Southeast Asian region and the Indo-Pacific region. Now, especially for all those who signed up today, uh, we have a very special set of speakers. Uh, I would describe them as the awesome threesome, right? Um, number one on the list is Professor J. Batong Bakal. Um, number two, uh, Professor Robert Beckman. And number three, Dr. Makoto Seta. Right. All of these are very distinguished speakers, distinguished researchers, distinguished academicians in their relative fields. Uh, I'm, I'm so honored to be in their company today. Um, I've actually got my notebook ready, as you can see, to, to take notes, right? Because uh, events like this rarely happen uh, in, in one's uh, lifetime. So, Thank you to Mima for organizing this. Uh, now, let me start by introducing the famous Professor J. Batong Baka. Right. Uh, he is the director of the UP Institute for Maritime Affairs and Law of the Sea. Uh, he teaches courses on property obligations and contracts and the law of the sea and natural resources. The Leonard Professor obtained his LLB in 1991 from UP College of Law, uh, his master's degree in marine management, and his doctorate in science of law uh, from uh, Dalhousie University in Canada. His graduate degrees were acquired under scholarship grants from the Canadian International Development Agency and the prestigious Pierre Elliott Trudeau Foundation respectively. Um, uh, Trudeau Jr. I believe is a very popular pop, uh, politician, I think among the uh, younger voters in Canada now. 
Um, taking advantage of his uh, graduate training in interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary studies, his career spans a diverse field of maritime policy research. The learner professor was a member of the technical team that prepared and defended the Philippines' claim to a continental shelf beyond 200 nautical miles in the Banham Rice region, made a submission filed with the Commission on the Limits of the Continental Shelf, pursuant to uh, Article 76 of the Law of the Sea Convention. Uh, the CLC has recognized Philippines' jurisdiction over the Banham Rice region in April 2012. So uh, Professor Jay has left his mark on history. Now, the uh, second speaker that we have today is also the very famous Dr. Professor Dr. Robert Beckman. Um, his articles are usually recommended reading for students studying Law of the Sea. Uh, professor Beckman um, is an emeritus professor at the Faculty of Law at the National University of Singapore. Uh, he has been with NUS for more than 40 years and taught various courses in public international law. He specialized in ocean law and policy and in international regulation of shipping. The learned professor was a founding director of the Center for International Law, the university level research institute at NUS. And he is currently the head of CIL's ocean law and policy program. He is also a senior advisor to the maritime security program of the Institute for Defense and Strategic Studies at Nanyang Technological University. Professor Beckman is also a member of the governing board of the Rhodes Academy of Ocean Law and Policy. He has special interests in ocean law and policy issues in Southeast Asia, including governance uh, of the Straits of Malacca and Singapore and the maritime disputes in the South China Sea. In 2020, the learned professor was nominated by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs Vietnam to the list of arbitrators under Annex 7 of the 1982 UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. Um, those are very impressive, impressive credentials. Now, uh, the third speaker, but not the last but not the least, right, uh, is also uh, a very well known um, uh, writer and researcher in. Um, the Law of the Sea Arena, Dr. Makoto Seta. Now, Dr. Seta is an Associate Professor of International Law at Yokohama City University, Japan. Uh, he holds a PhD in Law from Waseda University, uh, an LLM from LSE, and an LLB from Waseda University. Uh, he worked as a Research Associate at the Institute of Comparative Law uh, at Waseda University from April 2013 to March 2015. Uh, in his 2013 article, Regulation for Private Maritime Security Companies and Its Challenges, um, that particular work received an award from the Yamagata Maritime Institute. Congratulations. Um, his primary interest is law of the sea, especially ocean governance, universal jurisdiction over maritime crimes, private standards under the law of the sea. And his publications include um, the uh, very popular monograph, International Law for Ocean Governance, uh, published by Sansido in 2015. Right, as you can see, all three speakers have very impressive CVs. I can't wait to hear from them. And I think my, my hand will be tired, you know, just taking notes from this session. I hope I have enough paper. So without further ado, I shall invite the first speaker, Professor Jay, right, um, to present um, his slides and uh, to speak on the topic in session one today. Okay. Uh, Professor you. Jay, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, dear co-organizers, colleagues, and friends, uh, it is indeed an honor and pleasure to see you again and to continue our discussions on our common interests in the Maritime Marina. Uh, the Southeast Asian region lies in the very center of the Indo-Pacific, ecologically, geographically, biologically, economically, and politically. 
maritime events and issues in Southeast Asia will inevitably reverberate throughout all throughout this region and thus we cannot begin to appreciate the challenges we face without first looking first and foremost um, at our own marine spaces and marine challenges. Uh, for this reason, the South China Sea, as already noted, uh, which lies at the heart of maritime Southeast Asia, will always remain the primary focus of our concerns even as we consider expanding our horizons to the greater oceans in the Indo-Pacific. The South China Sea Award, which the Philippines won and China persistently refuses to acknowledge and comply with, uh, exposes a very basic and critical issue confronting the international legal system. As correctly and succinctly put, uh, put by our colleague Professor Yoshifumi Tanaka in his uh, book thereon, the South China Sea arbitration discloses the opposition of fundamental values existing in the international community, such as between the unilateral expansion of, of national jurisdiction and the integrity of UNCLOS, that is a clash between unilateralism and multilateralism, uh, between the promotion of states' interests against those of community interests and between the voluntary procedure and compulsory procedure of international dispute settlement. He further points out that by presenting such a stark contrast, the award seems to challenge the international community to choose the values its members wish to support. Discussion of values is quite underappreciated in most legal discussions about the award and UNCLOS since 2016 and is totally lost, I, I believe, amid the conventional might versus right debate that focuses on real politic and the pragmatic pursuit, pursuit of state interests. Understanding the issue of compliance, or in this case non-compliance, with the South China Sea Arbitration Award and the importance of advocating right over might should also be based on consideration and commitment to the role that law should play in the governance and management of relations between states as members of a still evolving global community. Apart from the issue of unilateralism and multilateralism and individual versus community interests, advocacy for compliance and respect for the South China Sea Arbitration Award must also be secured by a commitment to the idea that UNCLOS and international law itself must be based on democratic principles that must be protected and enhanced in order to promote equity in an international society. The idea of the rule of law is one of, its, uh, one of these core principles. The United Nations defines the rule of law as a principle of governance in which all persons, institutions, and entities, public and private, including the state itself, are accountable to laws that are publicly promulgated, equally enforced, and independently adjudicated, and which are consistent with international human rights norms and standards. The rule of law has been recognized as a key element in the achievement of the purposes of the United Nations because it ensures that international law and the principles of justice apply equally to all states and are equally adhered to. Only under such conditions will it be possible to achieve the solemn purposes of the UN Charter. No nation, not even China, can deny the necessity of law to maintain a stable and orderly society. This applies to both domestic and international spheres. But not all nations have the same notions about law and the role it plays within a society, and the term rule of law does not necessarily connote the same thing for all states. In the context of developments in the South China Sea, particularly the so-called lawfare that has been waged lately surrounding the South China Sea Arbitration Award, it is important to underscore that the fracture between China, the region, and the rest of the world arise because of, a profound, of profound differences in the interpretation of the rule of law. Compliance with law assumes that all parties involved are all on the same page with respect to the concept, purpose, and nature of law. But here, clearly, we have a problem. China's conception of the rule of law is dissimilar from the more prevalent conception outlined by the United Nations, which are based on liberal democratic legal theory uh, that raise the ideals of law above even the most powerful entity within a specific legal system, that is the state, and subordinates even the state to some fundamental or constitutional more norms. In the last few years, China's legal theory as reflected and expounded in the official speeches of President Xi Jinping about the rule of law and endorsed by the organs of the Communist Party have highlighted a serious gap which is increasingly resonating in China's approach towards the South China Sea Arbitration Award and UNCLOS. While correctly espousing more common ideals about law and how it can benefit society, the rule of law advocated in China is described to be distinctly socialist with Chinese characteristics and promises most of the benefits that any person or society could be expected to seek from a perfect legal system. However, 
China also emphasizes that the rule of law is not to be regarded as a supreme abstraction of behavioral norms that can create fundamental restraints on excessive exercises of state power, but rather it is an instrument wielded exclusively by the Communist Party of China, not even the state technically, even though the CPC identifies with the state. China's modern version of the rule of law expressly rejects the potential restrictions of law on state conduct and firmly secures control of the rule of law by the CPC. Indeed, clarifications of the concept of what a socialist rule of law with Chinese characteristics is expressly reject the more common liberal democratic theories of law. As President Xi famously said, China must, quote-unquote, never allow, never follow the path of Western constitutionalism, separation of powers, or judicial independence. This clearly means that for China, law is merely an instrument of statecraft, in a sense much more susceptible to being wielded to implement the CPC's decisions and pursue its objectives without the expectations of at least some limits or restraints often found in Western liberal democratic theories of law. Strict control of the rule of law by the party is deemed absolutely essential to securing order and sovereignty and portrayed as the logical extension of the wishes of the Chinese people only, not of a broader community of which they are part. From the official Chinese perspective, therefore, there is no supremacy of law as it is often thought in most Western legal theory. Instead, there is supremacy of the party. And the socialist rule of law with Chinese characteristics, in fact, affirms the party's domination of the legal system and their reign above the law. Abs absent from this approach is the idea of law as a restraint on power, which may accumulate in the hands of select individuals or organizations. For this reason, various writers have taken to stress that the Chinese legal system interprets the concept of the rule of law as rule by law, which logically implies rule by the CPC. Without debating on the merits or demerits of a state's political perspectives, however, the more concerning aspect of this is that the CPC has not exactly been a good mold model of restraint and respect in its deployment of raw state power against those who happen to disagree with it. This partly explains the vitriol and disdain the China exhibits for the South China Sea arbitration in everything from concept, constitution, process, and outcome. The idea that the Chinese state, and by extension the CPC, could be subordinated to a higher system of law directly contravenes a pillar of its very existence and structure. And worse, the idea that a legal framework such as UNCLOS could exist and operate beyond the CPC's influence undermines the legal theory that justifies and supports its supreme position within the Chinese state. And at a more visceral level, the South China Sea arbitration is direct, uh, directly challenges the CPC's edict that the South China Sea is and has always been Chinese territory. It is a an affront not only to the theory of law, but at the CPC itself. Responding to these direct and continuing challenges, China has therefore expressly embarked on the task of changing international law to suit its own concepts, conception. Early in January 2021, the government published its five-year plan for the construction of a rule of law in China. And although the document is predominantly concerned with the modernization of the Chinese legal system, it should be noted that the program includes specific lines of effort to actively participate in the formulation of international rules and promote the formation of a fair and reasonable international rule system and to accelerate the construction of a legal system applicable outside the jurisdiction of China. These follow on earlier commitments to look into using international law to provide the basis and support for the extraterritorial application of relevant Chinese laws and to use the rule of law to effectively respond to challenges, prevent risks, make comprehensive use of legislation, law enforcement, justice, and other means to carry out the struggle and resolutely safeguard national sovereignty, dignity, and core interests. Now, while every nation indubitably has the right to participate in the making of international law, and in the course of doing so may be expected to pursue its own national interests, the assumption is that the resulting agreed norms would represent a minimum compromise. In the case of the South China Sea, however, China's insisted that its, sovereign on, that its sovereignty and claimed rights are beyond compromise. Thus, other nations cannot assume anything other than China's expectations of these lines of effort are intended to ensure acknowledgement of all of China's claims and conversely the surrender of their, their rights and entitlements under UNCLOS. In fact, China's current actions in the South China Sea, from unilateral fishing to the conduct of resource exploration and exploitation, already demonstrate its intention of imposing its own views and positions upon the rest of the region, regardless of prevailing international norms. 
the use of gray zone operations and the exploitation of loopholes and gaps in the law of the sea to impose itself and its activities within claimed waters do not reflect a longer term vision of eventual compromise but instead a determination to pragmatically ensure the achievement of only its own goals. In the past year especially, the regional countries have all borne witness to China's unilateral assertions that totally disregard their respective rights and entitlements. Fishing and maritime militia activities, petroleum exploration, marine scientific research, to give a few examples, that should have been moderated by norms agreed upon in UNCLOS, but which now appear to have been totally disregarded. These activities are, have accompanied China's modernization of its laws and avowed intention of expanding the influence of its legal system. This represents the newest phase, or perhaps the next escalation point, of the multifaceted South China Sea disputes. This therefore brings us to the compliance dilemma, which, especially for smaller nations of the region, should not really be seen as a dilemma. A dilemma is defined as a difficult choice between two equally undesirable alternatives. But whether or not regional or external states should or should not advocate compliance is not a dilemma. There is a very, very clear choice. We will either A, defend the existing international legal system that secures an equitable division of rights and jurisdiction over ocean space, as well as a process for settlement of disputes that had already been agreed upon on the basis of equality and participation, or B, accept that such an international legal system should be changed in order to suit the purposes and views imposed by one state's political rulers. It would seem that even without considerations of real politics, basic legal theory makes the choice of smaller regional countries as well as of non-regional states very, very clear. The problem then she seems to be not one of how to get China to comply with the South China Sea Arbitration Award given how it intends to act to diminish it and make it irrelevant under a new international or legal order that it seeks to impose. China will not comply and is working and will work in many different ways to get other countries to accept that and to change the law itself to legitimize its non-compliance. So the real challenge is how to persuade other countries no, other than China to strongly reinforce and vigilantly protect the South China Sea Arbitration Award and UNCLOS because of what they represent. The proper and equitable allocation of ocean space, resources, and jurisdiction in accordance with an agreed international legal system that had already incorporated and adjusted the interests of all states through UNCLOS. All states with a stake in the current system with international law, which, despite its flaws, at least strives to uphold principles of equality and fair dealing, must take a stand. There should be no hesitation, no equivocation. It is not only an issue of treaty provisions and interpretation of text or arguments about practice and custom. It is also an issue of the very theory of international law that we subscribe to. And ultimately, as Tanaka-san points out, it is a choice about the kind of international community that we all wish to secure for all of our futures. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Prof. J. Um, that was really interesting. Uh, a lot of food for thought there. Um, I, I'm sure the participants will have a feeling Q&A later. Um, next, uh, we move on to the presentation from Professor Beckman. Uh, Prof. Beckman, the floor is all yours. Thank you very much. Uh, can you see my slides okay? Yes, indeed. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I will be dealing with uh, the compliance dilemma upholding what I call UNCLOS uh, towards a peaceful Indo-Pacific. Uh, part one is simply background for those that don't uh, understand the whole history and so on, the UNCLOS, its importance and its limitations. It is generally regarded as the constitution for the oceans. It was uh, adopted after nine years of negotiations, which included all of the states surrounding the South China Sea, including China. Right? We sometimes hear that it was a Western created document. There were more than 150 states participating, including uh, most of the countries that had been under colonial domination during the prior to the end of World War II. And China itself participated throughout the nine years of negotiations. The, uh, and China is a party to the convention along with 168 other, 60, 167 other, state, other parties. 
there are what I call two grand compromises in the convention that meeting the demands of the developing countries and uh, others. One is rights and jurisdiction over natural resources was clarified giving coastal states a 200 nautical mile economic zone and allowing them to extend their continental shelf and providing that resources beyond national jurisdiction were common heritage of mankind uh, administered by the uh, International Seabed Authority in Jamaica. The second grand compromise relating to the passage regimes for ships and aircraft which provided for the extension of the territorial sea to 12 nautical miles and special regimes for straits used for international navigation, such as the Straits of Malacca and Singapore and archipelagic sea lanes passage through the major archipelagos such as uh, Indonesia and the Philippines. And with high so-called freedom of navigation or high seas freedoms everywhere beyond the outer limit of the territorial sea of 12 nautical miles. Another very important feature of the Law of the Sea Convention, which does not exist in most other conventions, is that the dispute settlement procedures are binding. Um, with a very limited exceptions, any dispute between two parties to the convention on its interpretation or application is subject to compulsory binding procedures. Most international agreements do not have compulsory dispute settlement. The Law of the Sea Convention was by the drafters intended to uh, develop a constitution for the oceans containing some arguably deliberately ambiguous provisions. The drafters knew that disputes would arise and therefore part of the package deal in the convention is you must accept the entire convention without making re reservations. And you also must, when you ratify the convention, subject yourself to the compulsory dispute settlement procedures. Now, certain issues that I think sometimes the press is a little confusing on this are not governed by the Law of the Sea Convention. One of them is it's, a, it's an oceans convention. It has no provisions on how you determine who has the better claim to sovereignty over a disputed land, including disputed islands. There's nothing in UNCLOS about sovereignty disputes. If you want them resolved, you have to like Singapore and Malaysia and Malaysia and Indonesia, go to an international tribunal and ask them to examine the sovereignty claims to see which one is superior. The second issue that whether a state has a right in principle to undertake land reclamation on islands it occupies and claims sovereignty over, there's no provisions in UNCLOS. There's the provisions on duty to cooperate, uh, obligation to protect the environment, which was brought out in the land reclamation case between Malaysia and Singapore. The law of the sea, the, the South China Sea arbitration also clarified that you can't change the status of a feature through reclamation works. You can't change a low tide elevation into an island or you can't change a rock into an island entitled to a continental shelf. But there's nothing in the convention that dictates whether or not you can build military facilities on an island. I continue to read in the newspaper that China's defying the decision of the tribunal by continuing to put military facilities on islands. I like someone to refer me to the provision in the convention that uh, states that because I don't find anything in the convention that limits what activities there or what you can construct on an island that you claim sovereignty over. Now there's deliberate ambiguity in several of the conventions to even after nine years of negotiations, the way the conference was able to reach agreement on certain provisions is to make them deliberately ambiguous. So both sides could walk away saying, well, we didn't get what we wanted, but the other guys didn't get what they wanted either. We agreed on compromise language. One of them provisions was the, how you, what the rule is on delimiting an economic zone or continental shelf. 
another clause which was uh, put in, in uh, early in the negotiations and could never reach agreement on proposals to make it clear. Rocks which cannot sustain human habitation or economic life of their own. No more clarity to that was agreed to at the convention. Article 58.1 as provisions which the Americans proposed uh, to ensure that their military uses of the oceans uh, beyond 12 nautical miles, referring to other internationally lawful uses of the sea relating to the freedoms of navigation and overflight. But that's a rather ambiguous term where there are some issues as to how it should be interpreted. Obligations to give due regard to the rights and duties of the coastal state if you're exercising high seas freedom. Again, it's not intentionally ambiguous, but it does give rise to different interpretations. There's some gaps in the convention. Surveys is not defined. What do we mean by a survey? Is it a hydrographic survey? Is it a survey for purposes of uh, submarine cable uh, routing? Is it a is it a military survey, et cetera? There's no definition of surveys and there's no definition of marine scientific research in the convention. Uh, one of the major gaps, even though there's a whole part 13 on marine scientific research, there's no precise definition as to what we mean by that. Uh, there's no, it's not clear whether it clarified the rules on innocent passage by articulating, I believe it's 12 activities in which uh, passage would be deemed not innocent, but it's not clear if that's an exhaustive list or that's a list of 12 examples. Uh, it's also not clear if coastal states can make innocent passage of certain vessels, which they regard as a threat to their environment, can be made subject to notice or consultation. I think it's quite clear you can't make it subject to consent because then you wouldn't have a right. You certainly don't have to get someone else's permission to exercise a right. But there are going to, a stronger argument could be made that certain, act, certain types of ships should either give notice or seek consultation. But overall, those are some of the weaknesses and general uh, vague ambiguous provisions. But overall, it was a remarkable achievement. It took 12 years, but it does set a constitution for almost all activities in the ocean, serves as the basis for the rules-based order in the oceans, and it can particularly, it can give legitimacy to the position of smaller states when challenged by larger powers with greater political, economic, and military power. Uh, part two, I'm gonna talk about UNCLOS and the rules-based order in the Asia Pacific. It serves, in my view, as an authoritative guide to how the world can judge whether the conduct of a state is in conformity with the rules-based legal order. And again, the key is that if two states have a dispute on whether the conduct of one of them is contrary to its other obligations under UNCLOS, and your dispute cannot be resolved through negotiation, one party has a right to invoke the dispute settlement procedures again, with certain limitations. Decisions of courts and tribunals are legally binding on the two states' parties to the dispute, even if one of them, as in the South China Sea arbitration, decides not to participate. You can, you can decide not to participate, but the other side can request the tribunal to proceed in your absence, and the provisions of the convention are very clear. The final result of that uh, tribunal is binding on both states' parties to the dispute. Now, the 216 arbitral award in the South China Sea case, it affirmed the practice of the ASEAN states bordering the South China Sea. If you look at the economic zone claims prior to this decision, beginning arguably in 2009, whether it's Malaysia or the Philippines or Indonesia or Vietnam or Brunei, none of the ASEAN countries claimed an economic zone from any of the disputed islands. They claimed an economic zone only from the low water line along the coast from which they measure all their maritime zones 
or in the case of Indonesia and the Philippines from their archipelagic baselines. Uh, none of the features, uh, and therefore the decision of the arbitral tribunal in effect affirmed the practice that had been followed by the ASEAN countries. That is that claims to an economic zone or a continental shelf should be made from the baselines along your coast. And then none of the features in the Spratleys were islands entitled to an economic zone or continental shelf of their own. Decision also affirmed the principle that a claim to historic rights in the economic zone of other states is contrary to the provisions in UNCLOS because UNCLOS gives the coastal state sovereign rights and jurisdiction to an explore and exploit the resources in its economic zone or on the continental shelf, the resources on the shelf. If you are given one state sovereign rights, that means you're giving up historic rights. Nobody else no longer has historic rights because when the convention was drafted, there was an idea that the coastal state had preferential rights in their fishing zone along their coast, but it must recognize historic rights of others. That's what the one of the or decisions announced in uh, the ICJ in 1974. But the developing countries at the conference insisted on an economic zone, giving the coastal state the sovereign right to all of the resources out to the 200 mile limit. And therefore, historic rights were done away with. Uh, the Indo-Pacific states and the rules-based legal order, this was again, most recently, Malaysia's diplomatic note to the UN Secretary General regarding uh, notice that they're going, Malaysia is going to claim a separate, making a separate submission on an extended continental shelf in the South China Sea that was submitted in December 2019. It triggered what has been called a war of diplomatic notes between. Uh, China on the one hand and the ASEAN states bordering the South China Sea on the other hand, as well as many other states from the Indo-Pacific, including France, Germany, UK, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, US, also entering the diplomatic discourse by submitting note, diplomatic notes through the, to the UN Secretary General, and almost all of them of which challenge the position that China had taken in its diplomatic note. So the major issue in the South China Sea from the perspective, as I see it, of the ASEAN states bordering the South China Sea, it's not about freedom of navigation of vessels. It's not about freedom of navigation of commercial ships. My view is there's no really no threat to freedom of navigation of commercial shipping through the sea lanes in Southeast Asia. From the perspective of the Southeast Asians, is they have claimed under the law of the Sea Convention, sovereign rights and jurisdiction to the resources in their economic zone and continental shelf. And one of their neighbors, China, is asserting a claim that it has a right to those same resources, either through a doctrine of historic rights so we're based on the nine dash line map or based on some other theory, perhaps sometimes that the islands that it claims are entitled to an economic zone continental shelf of their own. The claim of China is never exactly clear, but they are not making a claim that is consistent with UNCLOS as interpreted by the arbitral tribunal. Now, I think this might be my final slide. I wanted to have more, more time for questions. How can then states in the Indo-Pacific outside of the ASEAN, how can they enhance the rules-based legal order? Well, I think if we start with the ASEAN states themselves, I think those bordering the South China Sea should evaluate their claims that they're making to economic zones and continental shelf to determine, for example, are you occupying a low tide elevation in the economic zone of another state? If so, perhaps uh, you are occupying something that another state actually technically has jurisdiction over. The ASEAN states also should give a higher priority to resolving 
their own maritime boundary disputes with each other, uh, with their neighbors, so that they're on a higher moral ground when they want to criticize China. How should other states in the Indo-Pacific deal with the South China Sea disputes? I think one is they should consult with the ASEAN states on how they could support the rules-based legal order. One of the dilemmas, of course, the main issue is from the Southeast Asians perspective, it's China claiming rights to the resources which under UNCLOS belong to them. Well, then how can the other states support that other than by diplomatic notes which support the position of the Southeast Asian countries? Uh, as far as I could see, the so-called phone ops, the freedom of navigation operations, are not responding in any way to China claiming fishing rights or hydrocarbon rights that it does not have at, under the Law of the Sea Convention. Uh, another issue that I think should be thought about by the states that are supporting uh, rules-based legal order is they should evaluate their own claims to an economic zone and a continental shelf from small inhabited features. It's unfortunate that some of the countries that are criticizing China take the position, well, the South China Sea arbitral award is binding on China and the Philippines. But the South China Sea award interpreted the intentionally ambiguous language in Article 121.3. And it made a distinction between rocks, which are not entitled to an economic zone or continental shelf, and the larger islands, which are. And the criticism that Chinese often make, and my friends in Taiwan make, is that states, including the sponsors of this uh, workshop, Japan and uh, Australia and the United States, all themselves are claiming an economic zone from offshore features, which arguably are rocks under the law of the sea convention entitled to no more than a 12 mile territorial sea. Now it weakens the criticism of China of not following international law if you say, well, that decision is binding only on China and Philippines, and therefore we can have our own interpretation of what a rock is, and therefore we don't regard the law, the sea, or the arbitral tribunal award as an authoritative interpretation of what Article 121.3 means. We only interpret it as something which binds the two parties in that case. Well, that weakens the effect of the rule of law. My proposal would be whenever a uh, court or tribunal interprets a decision of a, a convention which you're a party to, you should review your own practice to see whether it's consistent with the interpretation provided by that tribunal. Uh, I think that's all. Happy to respond to questions later. I'll try to stop share now. Uh, thank you, Professor Beckman. Um, I, I just love the way you know you highlighted all the essential points uh, on UNCLOS. Um, it's actually a student's dream, you know, to to actually hear a presentation like that. You know, then finally it helps um, a, a student to actually you know like uh, finally get what the Law of the Sea Convention is all about. I think you no, know, frequently we just dive in so deep that you know we don't really look at um, you know, the overall picture of what UNCLOS is all about. Uh, that was really interesting. Um, but next, um, we have our third distinguished speaker, uh, Dr. Makoto Seta. The floor is yours. Um, okay, so thank you for your kind introduction, kind introduction Dr. Wee. So good afternoon, good morning, good evening, everyone. My name is Makoto Seta. So before starting my presentation, I would like to extend my sincere gratitude to Maritime Institute of Malaysia, MIMA, and all organizers to give me the opportunity to speak at this exciting webinar. And I thank all the participants. Okay, and so can you see my slides? Okay, yes, thank it's, you. It's clear. So, yeah. 
I'm an associate professor of international law at Yokohama City University. And uh, do you know Yokohama City? So last year, Yokohama port might be notorious as a port where Diamond Princess was calling it. Diamond Princess is a closed vessel in which COVID-19 spreaded. So actually, Yokohama City is a good port city with many sighting spots. So if you have an opportunity to come to Japan after this pandemic is over, so please, uh, shortly, I believe, so please visit and enjoy the city. Okay. And yeah, this is the uh, Yochi, a mascot character of my university. So some of you might have the Japanese image as such cute character. So the title of my presentation is Toward the Peaceful Indo Pacific, toward the Indo sorry, Toward the Pacific, Peaceful Indo Pacific through the shared understanding of the law of the sea. So, and this is the contents of my presentation. So after the introduction, I will address shared understanding as the preparation for judicial proceedings in second part and using the judicial decision for establishing the shared understanding in the third part. And finally, I make a conclusion. So this symposium focuses on the Indo-Pacific region, which mostly consists of the maritime area and not to lands, as this map shows. Of course, those maritime areas are important for acquiring natural resources, both living and non-living resources, but at the same time, it is important as a shipping lane. So as Professor Beckman said, resource is more important more, more important than freedom of navigation for Asian states, but for Japan, so probably freedom of navigation is more vital, especially in the South China Sea. And uh, so therefore the order and stability of the maritime area in the region are quite important. However, recently the region has been unstable and one of the possible reasons is recent Chinese, China's expansionism to the maritime domain without the shared understanding of the law of the sea. So in this presentation, I want to address two specific conducts by the superpower in the region, China, so and uh, without the uh, shared understanding of the law of the sea. So first, new legislations related to the Chinese Coast Guard, CCG, which entered into force this year. And second, Chinese attitude against the 2016 arbitral award, so non-compliance, the international judicial decision, so actually my uh, so previous speakers are already mentioned uh, uh, this one, so, but I also want to uh, put my idea on, that on the same topic. Okay, the first one is deeply related to the East and the South China Sea. So because in these two areas, so since China and its neighboring states have overlapping claims, maritime law enforcement organizations such as CCG and Japan Coast Guard, JCG, face each other quite often. So this picture is taken at the maritime areas surrounding Senkak Islands, and the left small boat is a Japanese fishing vessel, and the light big one is a CCG vessel. So the CCG vessel tries to police the Japanese fishing vessel, which engages in unlawful fishing from a Chinese law perspective, but lawful fishing from a Japanese law perspective. So this happens because both states claim sovereignty over the same island. So the, so the maritime area surrounding the island is from Chinese law perspective, it's Chinese territorial water, but from a Japanese perspective, it's Japanese territorial water. So the JCG vessel tries to interfere with the police activities conducted by CCG in this way. But uh, both the Japanese and Chinese coast guards usually do not take any measures against each other so far. Why? So they probably consider that if they take such measures, so probably it would constitute a violation of immunity granted to public vessels under customary international law. So international law works in this context. So, but, uh, so how we uh, respond to the Chinese new act? So that is the uh, question I will deal with. Okay, 
And the second one is a Chinese attitude against the 2016 South China Sea arbitration. So uh, this chart is the summary of the decision rendered by the arbitral tribunal. I'm sure that most of you are familiar with this decision. Here, so what I want to highlight is the tribunal found that China's nine dash line is invalid. So that means that also denied the historic rights, which China claims. So nevertheless, so China didn't accept this decision and still looks to maintain its position. So some of you might consider uh, this award is meaningless. So, but I don't think so. So on these two points, I want to address them one by one. Okay, so first, uh, so in the second part, uh, deal with, uh, I will deal with the Chinese registration. The first registration is new Chinese CCG Act, which entered into force on 1st of February, 2021. So this CCG Act was established to provide CCG with a legal foundation and guideline of law enforcement activities. So this act is administrative and procedural in nature. And as far as I understand, it strengthens the uh, CCG's military character. So this act is supposed to be applied to the China's jurisdictional water according to its Article 3. However, the uh, meaning and scope of jurisdictional water is unclear. So probably this water includes the South China Sea to which China claims its sovereignty. And when I look closely at this new CCG Act, I found it, sorry, I found it violate international, it would violate international law. I personally do not consider the enactment of this new law itself violates international law because we are not sure what jurisdictional water means. So if China applies this act only to its territorial water, it might not violate international law at all. Whether states violate international law or not, mostly depends on its domestic law application and not on enactment itself. However, I have to say that some provisions of this new act would be a cause of future Chinese violation of international law. And actually some states have already demonstrated their concerns on that point. I listed two consecutive articles, articles 20 and 21. Article 20 provides that CCG may remove the facilities built by foreign organizations and individuals in China's jurisdictional waters. If this foreign organization includes foreign government, and this act is applied to the South China Sea, for example, the application of this act would be a violation of the UNCLOS. So this is because this article enables China to remove remove facilities built by the Philippines, for example, in the Filipino waters, because China still maintain its position that most, port, most parts of the South China Sea belong to it. Even after the arbitral tribunal rendered that the Chinese claim of nine dash line is invalid under the current international legal framework in 2016. Article 21 stipulates CCG has a right to take measures such as deportation and forced towing even against foreign warships and government ships. So they are public vessels. So when they violate Chinese uh, law and don't follow the instruction. This act manifestly said that the CCG will take some enforcement measures even against foreign warships as well as government ship. So, if this provision is actually as a, actually applied as it said, it is likely to constitute a violation of immunity enjoyed by other states' public vessels. The second legislation is the Revised Maritime Traffic Safety Act, MTSA, which entered into force on 1st September in this year. So this act was established to strengthen maritime traffic management and safeguard Chinese rights and interest. Unlike the CCG Act, this act is more substantive in nature, but this act is also applied to the China's jurisdictional water, so which is also unclear and the same scope as the uh, CCG Act. But this act is also, uh, sorry, uh, one of the biggest differences uh, between CCG Act and MTSA is Article 1 to 1 of the MTSA. 
which said that when MTSA provisions are not compatible with the international treaty ratified by China, the international treaty shall prevail to MSA, MTSA rules. So this, look, law, this, so this rule looks to try to harmonize Chinese domestic law with international law. But I have to say that the, we are not sure whether the relationship between customary law and Chinese domestic law is uh, pro, uh, stipulated, regulated in the same manner. It is not clear. And uh, that being said, so some provisions might violate international law. For example, Article 120, uh, of the MTSA might violate the rules of sovereign immunity, which is granted to foreign worship as well as government ships. So if this provision is actually applied as it says, so same, so it is highly likely to constitute a violation of immunity enjoyed by other states public vessel. And uh, how should we respond to these superpower legislations? So please suppose a situation where the Chinese CCG, sorry, where Chinese Coast Guard arrest a Japanese Coast Guard vessel. So does it constitute a violation of international law? If so, what rules? So probably most likely such arrest would violate the immunity granted to Japanese Coast Guard vessels. But at the same time, we have to consider circumstances precluding longerfulness under international law, such as countermeasures. So because perhaps so from the Chinese perspective, uh, first, JCG violates Chinese sovereignty, and that is why Chinese Coast Guard took action against JCG. So I can assume that uh, China would uh, justify its position uh, by recourse to the countermeasure argument. But if the situation, so the arresting by arrested by the Chinese Coast Guard happened, so probably the Japanese government would consider bringing the case to international forum, especially the international judicial proceedings. And in its preparation, so Japan and other states may exchange views. And that is helpful not only for the Japanese legal tactics at the court, but also for establishing a shared understanding in the region. As far as I understand, so incidents between Coast Guard agencies could happen not only in their relationship with China, but also among other states, so such as Vietnam, Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippine relationship. So if we face the concrete situation and successfully establish the shared understanding, it is helpful for us to avoid future similar disputes. And if some states can have a shared understanding with Japan and circumstances allow, other states could intervene in the proceeding that, that Japan would initiate, as New Zealand did in the, uh, under, sorry, in the case between Australia and Japan. And second, so non-compliance. So uh, this is uh, uh, the third chapter, the third part, I'll uh, deal with the non-compliance of the arbitral award. The slides, the light, light part of the slides show the web page of Ministry of Foreign Affairs of China on the 2016 South China Sea Arbitration Award. And as most of you know, it said China solemnly declared that the award is null and void and has no binding force. So this Chinese, uh, but uh, as uh, Professor Beckman also explained, the uh, decision of Ancross Tribunal is binding. So this Chinese position uh, looks to contradict Article 296 of the UNCLOS, which provides finality and binding force of decision. Nevertheless, China has maintained this position after the award was rendered. And some of you might consider the award is meaningless, but I don't think so. So I listed the meaningful laws of the international judicial decisions in general. So first, so such decisions clarify rules of international law, which sometimes are very vague, as like the rules of immunity granted to public vessels. Also, the decisions contribute to spreading the shared understanding of international law. So textbook on international law usually cites such decision, international court decision. And third, decisions can be referred in public discourse and dialogue at the global level. And here, I want to highlight the reactions by state against the submission by Malaysia to the CLCS, which also <laughs> Professor Beckman mentioned, and how South China Sea arbitration works. 
This is the Malaysian partial submission on the South China Sea to the CLCS. So in this way, so Malaysia uh, claims the continental shelf inside of the so-called Nine Dash Line. And against this submission, so China uh, made an objection based on Article 5 of Annex 1 to CLCS rules of procedure. And according to this paragraph, uh, if, a, if a land and maritime, uh, if land or maritime dispute exist, and any of the states concerned in the dispute makes an objection, the uh, commission, CLCS, cannot consider the submission. So if the Chinese claim is accepted, Malaysia cannot get the recommendation from the CLCS and face a difficulty to extend its continental shelf lawfully under the UNCLOS. So China uh, considered the Malaysian claims, uh, Malaysia claims that maritime areas overlapping the Chinese waters and violates Chinese historical rights and sovereignty. And the right side is the reaction of states to Malaysian submit submission. It is surprising that it is China who submitted the most in the Malaysian submission. So this is because not only Malaysia, but also other states, both coastal and non-coastal states of the South China Sea, objected the Chinese claim. So while Malaysia has made three submissions so far, China has made submissions nine times, and Indonesia, Philippines, and Vietnam, who have a direct interest in the South China Sea, but uh, the US, Australia, uh, France, Germany, UK, which makes joint statement, Japan, New Zealand are also against the Chinese objection. I want to demonstrate some of the submission. Uh, for example, Indonesia, France, Germany, UK, and New Zealand refers to the arbitral award to deny the Chinese historical rights under the current UNCLOS regime. So yeah, this is the Indonesian submission, and this is a uh, joint submission by France, Germany, and the UK. And this one is the New Zealand. So why so many states join, them, uh, join and criticize China? So of course, so probably a political context must be taken into account. So, but from a legal perspective, since the arbitral tribunal made a conclusion on this point, states can easily echo the decision. And in this way, award can be used in public discourse, even if a decision is not immediately abided by China. Uh, and I, also, I want to show Malaysian counter argument against China. I read some parts out. So Malaysia rejects China's claim to historic lights with respect to the maritime areas of the South China Sea encompassed by a relevant part of the Nine Dash Line as they are contrary to the convention. On this point, I have two comments. The first one is that the referral to the uh, 2016 award makes the Malaysian counter argument more legally persuasive. So I don't know the Malaysian position on the 2016 award in general, but Malaysia didn't refer to the award in its counter argument submission. And it is a pity from the perspective of international law. In addition, uh, Malaysia didn't clearly claim that there is no dispute between Malaysia and China anymore. But if Malaysia would like to take advance of the CRCS proceedings, Malaysia needs to demonstrate it. So because as I explained previously, if there exists dispute and objection, the CLCS cannot consider the submission. The 2016 award is very useful in this context because one of the UNCLOS tribunals clearly said that the Chinese historical light is incompatible with the UNCLOS. So Malaysia could claim once the dispute existed between China and Malaysia, but it was solved by the 2016 award in a legal sense. Actually, Filipino argument against China looks at such a claim. In its submission, the Philippines said that the tribunal conclusively settled the issue of historic rights and maritime entitlement in the South China Sea. And conclusion. So current instability partly derives from the lack of shared understanding of the law of the sea, especially uh, not shared among China, the superpower in the region, and other states. So in this context, uh, international law cannot work in the same way as domestic law. However, it does not necessarily mean international law is meaningless.
as I demonstrated in my presentation as a whole and this slide. International law can play an important role even in the current situation in the Indo-Pacific region. So this is the end of my presentation, but uh, I'm sure that we have much Q&A times and I would like to exchange views with you. Terimakashi, thank you for your attention and arigatou gozaimashita. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Makoto. Uh, we have now reached the uh, end of the presentation part of the first session. Uh, now we have the all exciting question and answer session. Right, so I would encourage the participants to post their questions in the uh, Q&A uh, box in Zoom or they can even do it, I think, through the chat box in Zoom. Okay, while we are waiting for the uh, questions to pour in, um, <clears throat> I have a few questions myself. Uh, and with the permission of the speakers, uh, I would like to ask this question to all three of you. Right. Um, we, we've heard very interesting uh, arguments as to why China um, is actually bound by the uh, uh, arbitration decision. <clears throat> um, and we do understand that um, uh, their response is actually uh, not to respect it at all. Um, now, if you look at uh, how the uh, situation has escalated in the spread leads, um, China has responded by um, uh, actually militarizing the uh, Spratly Islands. So um, how would, you know, um, a legal response be you know, to the increasing militarization of the Spratly Islands by China? Um, can we uh, have uh, the uh, first answer, maybe from Prof. J? Yes, thank you. Uh, so uh, with respect to the militarization of the islands, well, admittedly, UNCLOS does not provide for much with respect to military activities. It is largely uh, um, uh, outside of the scope of UNCLOS, except for uh, the few provisions uh, uh, guaranteeing non-discriminatory treatment for military vessels, especially in case uh, in the situation of uh, passage rights. Um, nonetheless, um, I think that uh, with respect to that, that, that is already beyond the realm of law and more uh, in the realm of, of uh, political and military strategy. So I would, it's very difficult to say that this can be defined uh, strictly by law. But as the, the thing is, as long as the Southeast Asian nations, the smaller nations, um, continue to abide by the basic principles of the UN Charter, uh, particularly in Pacific settlement of disputes, then those uh, military installations uh, in a way will not uh, help uh, legitimize uh, um, China's uh, actions and activities. And actually the bigger problem I think right now is less the, the military uh, installations and more the uh, so-called gray zone operations that those military installations are indirectly supporting by maintaining, for example, uh, the bases uh, on um, Fire Cross Reef and Subi Reef and Mischief Reef. Uh, China has been using those uh, those uh, reefs to support things like the unilateral petroleum exploration being conducted by uh, China against uh, in the in the continental shelves of uh, say Indonesia lately um, as well as uh, other countries Malaysia and Vietnam and they've also been supporting the maritime militia operations as well uh, and and this there, there is growing documentation on the movements of these vessels which will really show that uh, these military installations are being used to support these uh, non-military or paramilitary activities and that, I think, will be the, um, the next uh, um, challenge you know, uh, for us uh, uh, lawyers, especially. How do we uh, try to moderate these activities given the limitations of UNCLOS? And then the, uh, 
the the use of these limitations precisely by China as a way of uh, um, um, well covering their other activities, uh, their other uh, coercive activities uh, in the region. <clears throat> Thank you, Prof. J. Uh, Professor Beckman, uh, would you mind sharing your thoughts on that? Yeah, I'll make a couple of comments. I think I agree with Jay. Everyone, as I pointed out, there is nothing in the Law of the Sea Convention that prohibits the state from uh, building military facilities on a disputed island which it occupies. Uh, Vietnam is militarized to a much lesser extent, most of the features that they occupy. So this is not governed by own clause. There's no way you could take them to dispute settlement on this issue. In fact, even under own clause, military ex activities are excluded under, uh, you can exclude them under an Article 298 ex exception, which China has done. Now, nevertheless, what they have done is they've changed the balance of power in the South China Sea through the construction of these activities. And as Jay said, they're also supporting their gray zone operations or Coast Guard activities or uh, maritime militia activities, which could be challenged in a sense that if they are undertaking surveys in the maritime zone of uh, Malaysia or Philippines, the legality of that survey are, could be challenged. Uh, but then it's a question again of to what extent the states want to uh, continue to go. Again, there's always the threat of a second case. Now, some people say, well, you've had one case and they've ignored it. Why would you have to bring another one? Well, the argument could be made that I think that the Chinese would not only be very upset, but it would be a very, if the second case were brought challenging some of their activities, it would create more political pressure on them uh, than that currently exists. The other comment is quite interesting. The case was announced in 2016. There was very little reaction by ASEAN countries or by the international community for the first couple of years. It is only since uh, 2019 and 2020 that more states have made statements that in effect have challenged China's uh, non-compliance with the decision. In other words, the authority of the decision seems to be gaining as a way to gauge whether their conduct is lawful or not uh, in the past year or so, more than it did in 2016. Now, there are various reasons for that, but I'll just point that out. Um. <clears throat> okay, uh, thank you, Professor Backman. Uh, Dr. Sita? Okay, so sorry. Any comments on that? Yep. So actually, I totally agree with uh, Jay and uh, Professor Beckman. So, yeah, so basically, the UNCLOS doesn't uh, provide the kind of a, uh, concrete rules on military operation. Uh, so, in that sense, uh, it's really difficult for us to apply UNCLOS and the solve the dispute uh, but directly. But uh, what I can say is that uh, Article 73, paragraph 74, and 83, paragraph 3 might be helpful to some extent because it provides the kind of obligation in the kind of a disputed maritime zones, so which was also debated, so recent decision by the ICJ between Somalia and Kenya. So actually, I'm not, too, I'm not sure to what extent it's applicable in that to the South China Sea region, but uh, if China consider that uh, it, there is a dispute between China and uh, other neighboring states, so China also uh, must comply with the obligation, such obligation in the undelimited maritime area. But yeah, even if so, uh, as we know, so China didn't uh, even ignore the uh, arbitral award. So in that point, on that point, so as Professor Beckman rightly pointed out, I also consider that the second litigation against China might make a stronger pressure, stronger political pressure and it would be helpful. So yes, that's my all comments. Thank you. Um, thank, thank you, Dr. Sita. Um, uh, the reason I asked that question was because I, I just wanted to see um, um, how far you know one could stretch uh, one's imagination you know, to see you know 
the extent to which UNCLOS could be used, even though it's clearly not supposed to apply to military matters. And anyway, thank you so much for your thoughts on that. Um, I have um, a few questions uh, submitted through the Q&A box. Um, the first set of three questions right, is from uh, Shafiq Aizad. Right. Uh, the first question that he poses is, in the case of uh, Batu Pute, uh, does UNCLOS apply during the submission on that issue? So, uh, case of Batu Pute or Pedro Blanca was a case not governed by the Law of the Sea Convention. It was a case on which the uh, state had the better claim to sovereignty over the three features, and that was brought by agreement between Malaysia and Singapore, and the decision was made. So UNCLOS really has no relevance as far as I can see to that. Uh, UNCLOS apply on the, I see the second two follow-ups on that, yeah. I think. If there's a conflict during the EEZ area, what he might be suggesting is that Singapore, I believe, has suggested that an economic zone could be claimed from Palau Batu Pute and whether the military can act. I would say, well, no, you're military, you're bound by something called the UN Charter to resolve your disputes peacefully. But if uh, there would be a legal right of Malaysia to challenge the right of a claim of an economic zone from Batu Pute, arguing in the same manner that uh, the features in the South China Sea were rocks entitled only to a 12 mile territorial sea, that same submission and that same issue could be brought before a tribunal to challenge any claim of a continental shelf or economic zone for Batu Pute. But we don't want to resolve these issues by the military. That's 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 a no-no, right? Uh, uh, yeah. Um, usually uh, things go pear shape whenever the military gets involved. And so um, maybe it can be used as persuasion, you know, but uh, should not go further than that. Um, uh, a any uh, response to those, uh, that trio, you know, that three questions uh, from Prof. J and Dr. Seta? Do you have anything you want to contribute to that? Okay, uh, thank you, Prof. J and Dr. Seta. Um, we have next from uh, Juan Charina. It's not really a question, it's just thank you all distinguished speakers. All right, well done. I I've really enjoyed the presentations. Um, uh, Ms. I'm not sure whether it's Mr. or Ms. Pongdo. Uh, this is for Professor Beckman. Um, how will you respond to the idea that International Law of the Sea Regime on Clause should be updated to reflect emerging maritime issues, new power balance to include issues that have not been covered before, like militarization or features or changes of features due to climate factors? I, this is a sort of a related climate change question. Well, as we see with the current negotiations relating to the not just climate change, but you have the BBNJ discussions in which they're attempting to get a, uh, a third in the implementation agreement, and that is going to go on for years. Basically, the Law of the Sea Convention is drafted in such a way that it's almost impossible to amend it. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the idea of amending the convention to reflect power balances, again, I'd say, why would you amend it to reflect power balances? You're, every state is treated the same. If you want to claim an economic zone, you claim it. It doesn't mean whether you're a poor, small country or a very large, rich country. The United States and China can make no greater claims from their land territory than the smallest, weakest island state in the Pacific can. It's intended to govern all state parties, not uh, have different rules for different countries. So on the issue such as power balance and, and 
national security or militarization uh, threats to security has to be dealt with through forums like ASEAN or Expanded Maritime Forum and others. Uh, you can't expect the law of the sea to be dealing with issues other than the oceans. That's, that's my view. Uh, Where, okay. where there's an issue of climate change, for example, that's being now yeah. studied by the International Law Commission and International mm -hmm. Law Association, because as you measure your maritime zones from baselines, but as sea level rise comes, many of your baselines may uh, disappear, be several miles inland, and then question of how does that affect your boundary agreements? How does it affect your economic zone claims, et cetera. That's a very difficult issue because it wasn't anticipated when the convention was drafted, but some very bright people are taking a look at it and they'll probably come up with some uh, suggested solutions, but one of the solutions would not be amending the law of the sea convention because that's almost, uh, it, that's too difficult to do. Uh, may I add uh, information on that point? So. Uh, so recently, Banuat and uh, Tuvalu decided to establish, uh, to establish the commission to request uh, advisory opinion. So I'm not sure how the scope will be limited, but uh, now some states are started to consider request advisory opinion to fix the probably maritime, their maritime zones, especially for the uh, small uh, uh, developing island states. So that's my understanding. And uh, yeah, as Professor Beckman explained, the IOC is also now in charge of that issue. So probably uh, rules would be changed without a modification of the anchors. Okay, uh, <clears throat> thank you, Dr. Seta. Um, and thank you, Professor Beckman. Uh, we have uh, another set of questions, this time from Tariq Fayaz. Um, he says, good afternoon, excellent presentations. My question is to either Dr. Makoto or Prof. Beckman. Um, there are multiple questions. Uh, firstly, what is the role of international law in the context of a new order in SCS and in the larger Indo-Pacific with regard to the balance of power in the region, given the recent development of Quad and AUKUS? And the second question is uh, also in the context of artificial islands, which China is building, what is the position under international law and could that be a probable solution for vulnerable islands such as Tuvalu, Kiribati and Nauru? Uh, Rob Bagman? Okay, let me hang on. Let me try to find it again. It disappeared. Okay. Um, in the context of a new order in the South China Sea, Indo-Pacific, Quad, and Akus, whatever, basically the law of the sea is still the same. These are really maritime security issues. It doesn't in any way change the UNCLOS or the law of the sea. In the context of artificial islands, let's be careful. As far as I know, China has not constructed any artificial islands. China has changed, has done reclamation works on uh, low tide elevations and, and turned them into islands, but they're still low tide elevations under the law of the sea. It has also taken small rocks and, and built military bases on them, but they're not artificial islands. They are geographic features in which they have been expanded, but the principle that the South China Sea arbitration confirmed is you cannot change the status of a feature. You cannot change low tide elevation into a rock. You cannot change a rock into an island entitled to a 200 mile economic zone. So it really has no effect on that. With respect to uh, impact on Kiribati and Tuvalu and so on, that's the issue of climate change. Now, if you, your low water line, if you can build a tower like the Maldives is doing, that means your island may never go underwater and you'll have 200 miles around it. But if you're a poor South Pacific country, you may not be able to reclaim to the level that uh, in some of your islands may go completely underwater one day. And that's one of the issues that is a very high priority for the Pacific Island states and some Indian Ocean states and even some in the Caribbean. And there's no answer on that yet, then, but uh, people are looking at and whether they can get a solution outside of UNCLOS. It's, uh, 
a cartoon. Okay, thanks, Professor Beckman. Um, okay, may I join? Uh, yeah, so uh, on the second question, I don't have anything to add. So as for the first one, so yeah, I basically have the same opinion with Professor Beckman. And, uh, but I uh, also I can emphasize the kind of position of the quad. So as far as I understand, probably quads uh, base is based on the uncross order. So, so it prefers to maintain the status quo. So uh, actually, so it doesn't have any intention to change the current order, even though the United States is not a member to the UNCLOS. But I think as far as I understand, so the all the member of the quad so prefers the current uh, regulation rules and law uh, regulation and law of the UNCLOS. So yeah, in that sense, it's uh, just a kind of a military coalition in the system of the UNCLOS and it doesn't have any intention to change the uh, system itself. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Zeta. Um, next, we have a question from uh, Bu Haida, uh, who's from the Center for International Law uh, from NUS. Uh, so Professor J, this is for you. Um, uh, have Philippines used the South China Sea Arbitration Award to gain the upper hand in the recent negotiations for joint development with China? Yes, uh, yes, thank you. Um, I'm not sure if what is meant by the upper hand, <laughs> if, in, if it's in the sense of gaining some uh, new concessions or additional, uh, get some additional success from the negotiations. Uh, well, I wouldn't call it upper hand, uh, but uh, what, what I do know is that the Philippines has insisted on maintaining the South China Sea Arbitration Award in those negotiations. And because of that, uh, there has been no um, uh, concessions made to China, uh, which might indicate some form of recognition of, of any kind of right in its favor. Uh, and instead, it, it is uh, probably one of the reasons why there is still no uh, outcome of that negotiation uh, because the South China Sea Arbitration Award precisely supports uh, the Philippines' claim to sovereign rights over these resources. And uh, that includes the right to demand uh, compliance with uh, Philippine laws uh, on petroleum uh, exploration and extraction, particularly those that refer to the service contracts. and. The Philippines is, uh, continues to insist that China we should enter uh, into petroleum uh, development uh, or China should have joint development only as a service contractor no, or under our service contract system and China refuses to, to accept that. So in that sense, uh, the arbitration continues to reinforce uh, the Philippine position uh, on, this, uh, on, on the joint development uh, negotiations. Okay, uh, thank you so much, uh, Prof. J. Um, next, we have a question um, for Professor Beckman from Wan Charina. Uh, what are your thoughts on the arguments that the dispute settlement procedures, as provided for in Section 2 of Part 15 of uh, UNCLOS, themselves are actually a hindrance in, in achieving compliance due to the options available? Hey, well, I, don't, I would not agree that they're a hindrance to compliance. I think the idea was to make it as flexible as possible so that the parties can affect choose either an arbitral tribunal, a special arbitral tribunal, or go to the International Court of Justice or go to the International Tribunal for Law of the Sea. Now, if the parties cannot agree otherwise, the so-called default mechanism is the dispute would go to arbitration under Annex 7, which is what happened in the South China Sea arbitration. Mm -hmm. But increasingly now developing countries in disputes with each other have been choosing a special tribunal or a special chamber of the International Tribunal for Law of the Sea. One reason for that, two reasons perhaps. One is it's much less expensive because the Tribunal for the Law of the Sea uh, handles the administration. You don't have to pay the PCA or anyone else, but also you have a say on who the judges might be that hear your case. So it has advantages uh, that many of the developing countries are taking a look at. Uh, I think the, 
there was some hesitancy to use the international tribunal early on because it was a new tribunal, but I think it's proved itself equally competent to the International Court of Justice, including in cases involving boundary delimitation. So I don't see that as the that is a weakness in terms of uh, compliance. The bottom line is whichever forum is used to resolve the dispute, you are both parties are legally bound by the decision. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's legally binding on them. And the question is, if you choose not to participate, or if you choose not to comply with the decision, the assumption was that we need a dispute settlement system, and then it's in everyone's interest to be subject to dispute settlement, and it's everybody's interest to promote rule of law by complying with the decisions. But sometimes cases are sensitive, and states decide that they will pay the political price for non-compliance. And that's, the, that's what happened. A little bit happened to the, uh, maybe Eric could comment on it tomorrow with the uh, Arctic Sunrise case of the uh, Russian Federation in the Netherlands. But uh, generally that's the issue. May I join? Uh, yes, please go okay. ahead. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so, uh, and uh, I also think that the multiple court is essential to attract uh, so many state parties. So because in the drafting process of the UNCLOS, uh, developed states prefer the ICJ would be the kind of a sole uh, dispute settlement body. On the other hand, so some developing states are against it because so developing states have the a kind of impression that the benches of the ICJ are occupied by the developed states. So ICJ is more a kind of a friendly to the developed states and not developing states. So that's why ITROS was also established as a second permanent court. And I think so. Uh, so far, I think the ITROS has so responded to the ex its expectation by the developing states, and so probably that is also another reason why developing. So, yeah, as Professor Beckman also mentioned, that why the developing states prefer to bring the case to the uh, special chamber of the ITROS. Okay, uh, thank you so much for your insight on that, uh, Dr. Seta. Um, the, the uh, politics or the behind the perception of the ICJ and the uh, Tribunal on the Law of the Sea has always been really interesting. Maybe there'll be time for it uh, in the not too distant future. Um, next, uh, we have someone from the press. Right, um, Trung Pham is a news editor in Vietnam. Uh, he has a question. Um, PCA is open. Uh, is to open a representative office in Vietnam. What are its implications for settling disputes in SES? Uh, in the case of Vietnam, uh, how could it contribute to the legal process of Vietnam? I think he's also expecting to read the reaction from China. Um, so um, may I go? Okay. Uh, yes, please. So actually, it's a little bit difficult question, but uh, as far as <laughs> I guess, so from a legal perspective, so it it doesn't have any meaning. So, but uh, from practical perspective, it's really helpful for Vietnam. So because it has mm -hmm. an office of the PCA at the uh, at the Vietnam. So. Of course, it's easier for Vietnam to recourse, to bring the case and to utilize the PCA as a secretariat. But uh, what we have to note is the fact that the PCA is not a kind of a permanent court or bench. So actually the function of PCA is a more kind of administrative issues. So as I said, so from practical perspective, okay, the office is located in Vietnam. So probably it's easier for the Vietnamese government to make a contact with the PCA staffs, but uh, it does not kind of uh, give a kind of any legal implication. And uh, on that point, um, I can predict that the China might be against the kind of a, uh, making use of that office because it's located in Vietnam. So China might can might claim that it could be biased or something like that. But uh, basically, the PCA, also, of course, wherever it is located, PCA should be neutral. And uh, yeah, the location uh, shouldn't be, doesn't have any legal meaning. 
but uh, yeah, from practical and also political context, it gives some implication. And uh, yeah, from Vietnamese perspective, uh, if the uh, Vietnam decided to bring the uh, to utilize recourse to the arbitral tribunals and also decided to use PCA as a kind of a secretariat for the proceedings. So in that case, uh, it is really helpful. Yeah, could I add a little bit? I think uh, the PCA handles primarily commercial arbitration cases, and that might be the uh, greatest impact of having an office in Vietnam. They also have a representative in Singapore. Singapore also has an agreement with the International Tribunal for Law of the Sea that its cases could be heard in Singapore. The advantage of that is if a case were brought under the Law of the Sea Convention, your government officials and your lawyers would not have to be de dealing with the time zone issues of the dispute between two Asian countries. They could hold the hearing in an Asian country where they wouldn't have to worry about more than one hour of a time change. So I don't think it would have much of an impact on a law of the sea case. As far as I can recall, and I may be wrong on this, I think they would have, the two parties would have to agree for the PCA in Vietnam to hear it. And therefore, if a case were brought by Vietnam against China, I can imagine that the Chinese would never agree to the PCA office in Vietnam, no matter how neutral they may be, of having the case heard in Vietnam. They'd want a more neutral venue, uh, even if they're going to participate. Okay, uh, thank you so much for that, um, Dr. Seta and Prof. Beckman. Um, uh, we have a, another uh, question to all the panelists from Hangzhou. Um, why do you think New Zealand submit the North Probalis that late? Do you think Western states' submissions were encouraged by the US submission? Um, second question, do you think the Arctic could become a new South China Sea from a legal perspective? That's quite a lot. <laughs> Who would like to go first? Uh, I, Prof. Jay, I, I see that yeah. your okay. window is yeah. uh, activated. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Well, I think uh, there's really no time uh, period anyway for uh, submitting these note verbals or mm -hmm. um, issuing these statements or, or reactions to the Chinese position. On one hand, it probably has been long in coming, but uh, I think that it's good that states are making their views uh, heard, you know, um, especially on something this important. Um, it's likely that New Zealand was uh, prompted by some event or activity, uh, which uh, they, uh, which sort of uh, provoked a reaction. But of course, we don't know exactly what that would be. It could could have taken place uh, some time uh, ago. We don't know. Uh, as for the other Western state submissions uh, being encouraged by the U.S. submission, um, well, there there is um, um, there is that possibility, of course, but there's also the possibility that those other Western states themselves, after observing uh, developments uh, in the South China Sea in the past couple of years, uh, they have come to the conclusion that um, it is necessary for them to issue those statements uh, very clearly. Uh, and, and take uh, a position, a very clear position uh, on what's going on. Um, they have, they, they cannot uh, uh, deny, uh, I guess, the, that the events really have become very, very prominent. No? Um, these uh, uh, incidents of interference or unilateralism taking place in the South China Sea, uh, what is clear here is that it is no longer uh, limited no? uh, to only the region uh, and other states now have realized that uh, it does have the potential of also now affecting their uh, respective interests, even though they're not, uh, say, within Southeast Asia or in the East Asian region. As for the Arctic, uh, of course, these are very different uh, situations geographically uh, and also in terms of the uh, parties involved, uh, as well as the history uh, of this, uh, um, um, this uh, area and the way that uh, the parties uh, to the dispute have um, comported themselves or engaged in uh, in this no so there's a much longer history of cooperation uh, primarily and also the fact that the arctic is not as well used or as uh, as used as much as say the south china sea and therefore the interests there 
uh, are not as uh, um, impactful, shall we say, on either the parties themselves or the, the region or the rest of the world. But uh, who knows, maybe in the future when, <laughs> if uh, climate change <laughs> it keeps on going and then the Arctic becomes a major waterway, maybe things will change. No, Let's hope it doesn't reach that point. <laughs> I just add one point. There are no sovereignty disputes in the Arctic. The Arctic is, uh, I think, almost 50% uh, Russian Federation bordered. The northern sea route is, uh, or the Northwest Passage is primarily Canadian. The real issue is to what extent the uh, Canada or Russia can control the rules on shipping going through or whether the IMO rules should come through. But I don't think in any way it's comparable to the South China Sea. Um, uh, Dr. Seta, do you have any uh, views to share on that? No. Um, uh, Dr. Seta, we can't hear you. I think we appear to be having a technical difficulty. Dr. Seta? Um, no, I, I can't hear you at all. Um, uh, Alif, can you hear Dr. Seta? No. No. So can you hear me? Uh, yes. Ah, okay, I, I'm, I'm yeah. terribly sorry. So for all of some technical problems happen. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'd like to uh, add the information on the fact that uh, um, in the Arctic, so several treaties have already been concluded, like uh, uh, search and rescue convention, and also the promotion of science. And the listen to the kind of a fishing agreement was also adopted. And interestingly, so actually in the South China Sea, probably the Japanese position and the Chinese positions are quite different. But the, in the Arctic, as a kind of a non-coastal states, non, non kind of a direct related states. So China and the Japan share the interest and the joint the kind of a framework of the Arctic together. So in that sense, I have the impression that the Arctic uh, is now very cooperative ocean. And uh, also uh, the Arctic Council successfully incorporates the kind of uh, indigenous people's group. So not just the kind of uh, uh, Arctic Council facilitate the kind of a stability and order in the region, but also the protection of the human rights and respect of the indigenous people. So in that way, I can say that the Arctic Council can be a kind of a good model for the South China Sea to establish a kind of a regional governance, so, re so governance of the regional ocean. That's my impression, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Seta. Right. Um, it's now 1653. Um, I have one question for all panel members. Um, that was actually triggered by something uh, Dr. Seta just mentioned, you know, you have like an equivalent of the Arctic Council to govern the area, right? Um, I'm gonna take that one step further, you know, but instead of uh, states, you know, having individual control of various parts of the Bradley Islands, uh, what about the Spratlys, right, being jointly, you know, um, governed by all the various stakeholders in that area and its resources shared equitably among all the stakeholders in that area, rather than fighting over it, you know, uh, it becomes a shared equity you know, for everyone. Uh, Prof. Jay, would you like to start the ball rolling? Yeah, trouble. I can start because I've oh, got okay. to leave. Okay. I have another okay. meeting at away. five. I can. Uh, right. One is that there are very few resources around the islands. The islands are only entitled at most to a 12 nautical mile territorial sea. So it's really not much that you're fighting about except the fisheries surrounding the disputed islands. Uh, Secondly, I think the fact that so many of the islands have been militarized, it's uh, very idealistic and perhaps not realistic 
to think that the con that the states concerned are going to allow it some kind of joint uh, management of islands which they have built military bases on. I think uh, well, the advantage might be we had discussions way back in the uh, workshops on managing potential conflicts on trying to create the uh, zone of peace or a zone of uh, make it a, a marine park of some kind that nobody is fishing in, but that's perhaps the best we can do, but that's before all the current militarization of the island. So at this point, I think we should uh, focus on perhaps what ASEAN is trying to do is how do you create mechanisms to ensure that the conflict doesn't arise of having hotlines and uh, so on between the military. So if there are unintended incidents at sea between your coast guards or state vessels that states don't fire, but they get on the phone and try to let the diplomats solve the problem. I think that's that's where I would go on it. And perhaps a, a agreement that let's all protect the environment and not no further militarization, but that might be a little too idealistic. I have to run to a meeting. I thank you all very much to Mima. I've enjoyed the conversation and the exchange. Uh, thank you so thank much, you. Prof Beckman. Sorry. Yes. Uh, and, uh, Prof Jane? Yes, sorry. Uh, there was a major noise event. That's why I couldn't answer. Uh, but uh, with respect to the question, I agree with uh, Bob. Now, given the developments in the region, it's become even more difficult to imagine some kind of uh, regional uh, uh, governance uh, structure no, where all states participate. However, I think that there we should explore, uh, number one, um, some kind of incremental and issue-based management mechanism. Uh, perhaps the idea, the, the idea here is to begin uh, with uh, achievable goals. So for example, I've just been there recently in the Spratlys and one major issue that which I think can be uh, addressed by all the countries uh, which is also in an acceptable way without having to be so politicized and not involving the military uh, aspects or strategic aspects. It's something as, as basic as the management of marine plastics, no? uh, plastic pollution. Uh, all the littoral states have uh, an interest in, in uh, combating that, and that will contribute to also uh, lowering uh, the rate of environmental destruction and degradation taking place in that area. So something along those lines, beginning with something simple and um, um, very straightforward is something we should explore. And then second, also I agree with uh, Bob, um, we need to think of mechanisms for preventing uh, incidents, especially with the kinds of activities that are uh, taking place there. Uh, the possibility of uh, incidents is, is increasing uh, with the deployment of militia and marine scientific research vessels and military vessels. It's inevitable no, that it's very crowded. And so these are not uh, unimaginable and we should at least talk about how to prevent incidents and if there is one, at least how to manage them so that it doesn't escalate into crisis. So small steps, I think, uh, at this point, no? uh, before we, uh, uh, and that way we can probably develop a little bit more confidence in, in moving towards more joint or shared uh, management uh, initiatives. Thank you. Um, thank you, Prof. J. Uh, Dr. Sita. Okay. Like okay. So, yes, I'm. Yeah. So, as uh, both uh, my colleague already mentioned, I'm not sure to what extent it is realistic. But uh, if the kind of uh, hydrocarbon resources are found, and uh, yeah, they, the coastal states need to develop it. So, in that case, occasion. So, the uh, precedent of the uh, Seychelles and Mauritius can be uh, a good example because now currently the. United Nations Development Program, so UNDP is kind of helping the both Seychelles and Mauritius to develop the natural resources jointly. And so in this way, so if the international organization, so reliable international organization also joins, so that might facilitate the kind of a cooperation among the states in the disputed water. water. So that's my idea. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Zita. Um, I understand the uh, session is supposed to end at five o'clock. Uh, so we have about 30 seconds left. Uh, I would just like to thank the three distinguished speakers, uh, Prof. J, uh, Prof. Beckman, and Dr. Seta. Thank you so much for your contributions today. Uh, thank you, Mima, for organizing this session. Uh, 
thank you to all the participants uh, and also the VVIPs that I've noticed uh, uh, who, uh, you know, uh, in this Zoom chat. Uh, so thank you so much, everyone. All right. Thank okay. you. Um, I would just like to thank our thank moderator, you. Professor Dr. Erwin Wee, and our speakers Welcome today Ali. for their informative presentations and fascinating exchange of ideas regarding upholding on class 1982 towards a peaceful Indo-Pacific. Um, I just want to express our gratitude once again to the Japanese Embassy in Malaysia and the Australian High Commission in Kuala Lumpur for the support. I hope you enjoyed our first session and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow at 9.30 in our second session entitled Disputes, Diffuse, and De-Escalation, Navigating the Power Contest in the South China Sea. To each participant, you have a sincerest gratitude for your continued support of MIMA activities and thank you and have a pleasant day. Thank you, everyone.